I'm a chemist and I spend a lot of time thinking about chemical molecules and antibiotics are really an important class of them. So I imagine that at least 99% of you have taken an antibiotic at some point in your lifetime. It may have been for something like strep throat, bronchitis, an ear infection, an eye infection, something like that. Now, these infections are ones that we pick up from other people or from a contaminated surface, and they're caused by pathogenic bacteria. So when we have these infections, we may go to our doctor's office, I hope you go to your doctor's office, and they would prescribe you an antibiotic. And the job of the antibiotic is to kill those pathogenic bacteria and keep us safe. So let's look at the example of penicillin. So when you go to the drugstore and fill your prescription, you may come home with a bottle that looks like this that contains some tablets. So what's in these tablets are many, many, many molecules that look something like this. We have carbon in black, we have hydrogen in gray, we have oxygen in red, nitrogen in blue, and sulfur in yellow. And when we have this bacterial infection, we have all these different bacterial cells mixed in with our own cells. Here's some schematics of what those cells look like. Our cells are on the top and the bacterial cell is on the bottom. And you can see that they look fairly different. Now what's important in the case of penicillin is that the cell walls of each type are made up of different materials. So what penicillin does is it targets a specific material in the cell wall of bacteria and it'll go ahead and lyse that cell wall, it'll break it down, and that causes the bacteria to die. And in this, our cells are not targeted and those are kept safe. So this is generally how antibiotics work. There's many different classes and they have different targets inside these bacterial cells and our cells are kept safe in the process of taking them. So what are some of the issues with the use of antibiotics today? You've probably heard of this issue called antibiotic resistance. Now, what this means is that bacteria, they see these antibiotics really as an environmental stress, right? These antibiotics are out to kill that bacteria. So what the bacteria are gonna do is they're gonna evolve under that attack in order to survive. So what the bacteria can do is they can alter their DNA, and this is a natural process, in order to fight off the action of that antibiotic. So that the bacteria can alter their DNA that looks like that hairball in the middle of the cell, and that'll fight off the action of that antibiotic. But what this means is that penicillin is then no longer effective against that bacteria. It's rendered completely inactive. So how do we go from just this one little resistant cell to a whole population of resistant cells? So if we imagine a little population like this where we have some normal bacterial cells and one resistant variety, well, under the course of an antibiotic treatment, we're gonna kill off all of those normal bacterial cells that are susceptible to the antibiotic. And right, you usually take antibiotics for a few days, and so bacteria are gonna to continue to replicate in your body under the course of that antibiotic treatment. So as we continue to take those antibiotics, the normal bacterial cells are gonna die, the, uh, the resistant cells are going to continue to replicate, and so under the course of an antibiotic treatment, only the resistant variety are going to survive. Now this is, an, again, a natural process, and so it's very, very hard to prevent the emergence of these resistant varieties. But there's some human actions that are really amplifying this problem. Now it's estimated that up to half of the use of antibiotics is either unnecessary or inappropriate. So if you've ever gone to the doctor with a common cold that's actually caused by a virus and you've been prescribed antibiotics, this is actually a completely inappropriate use of these very important drugs. Now, we can also have issues with inadequate diagnostics. If we're taking antibiotics for the wrong type of bacteria, this also amplifies this issue. We also see a really wide use of antibiotics in hospitals, and this also amplifies the problem. Now, you've also probably gone to the grocery store and seen labels on meat that say, no antibiotics fed. And this is also a really important issue. The use of antibiotics in livestock feed is only going to spread the emergence of these resistant bacteria. The more antibiotics we use, the more resistance we're going to see. Now, this is certainly not an issue that's tied to just one antibiotic or one bacteria. There are many different resistant types, and this is really a global issue. In the United States alone, we see over 2 million infections a year of these resistant bacteria, and sometimes they have resistance to more than one antibiotic. These uh, pathogenic bacteria are often, they are responsible for over 20,000 deaths a year. And also, we expect that there are even more deaths attributed to complications from these pathogenic bacteria, even when that's not the final cause of the death. And this is also something that's very close to my heart as both of my grandfathers have been infected by resistant bacteria. 
One of them survived, but the other passed away about three years ago from complications of a resistant bacterial infection. So what can we do about this problem? Well, the Center for Disease Control and Convention has identified a four-strategy approach. So the first is just preventing infection in the first place. We can prevent infection, we won't have to use antibiotics, and that's gonna slow emergence of that resistance. The second strategy is to track resistant bacteria. So if we can identify certain areas where we have these resistant infections, and if we can identify certain risk factors associated with those infections, then experts can develop strategies to combat those resistant infections. Now, the third is, is really an important one, is just improving our use of antibiotics. As I mentioned before, it's estimated that up to half of the use of antibiotics is completely unnecessary. So if we can even cut away some of that use of antibiotics, this is really gonna help us. And finally, if we can develop brand new antibiotics to combat these resistant bacterial varieties, this is of course going to help us. So while these first three strategies are really social issues, these are gonna be led by agencies like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and also the World Health Organization, where scientists really come in is in the development of new antibiotics. So that's what I'll spend the remainder of the time talking about. Well, where do we stand right now in terms of developing new antibiotics? This is a chart showing the development of antibiotics per year from about 1940 to 2000. You can see that there was this real golden age between about 1950 and 1970 where we were really pumping out antibiotics into the pipeline. And most of these were discovered by large pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly. Now you can see that we're really declining now in, in this era, and that's for a lot of reasons that I won't discuss. But you can see that there's really a need now for the development of new antibiotics. What I'd also like to point out in this slide that you may not have realized is that most of the antibiotics that are prescribed actually come from other microorganisms. They come from non-pathogenic microorganisms that produce these antibiotics naturally. So all of the names here in this chart that are listed in black are produced by one type of bacteria called actinobacteria. And this is what I'm really interested in. So actinobacteria, or actinomycete bacteria, are a phylum of bacteria that are a rich source of antibiotics. You've heard of tetracycline, vancomycin, erythromycin, a Z-pack. These are all antibiotics that are derived somehow from a molecule that came from an actinomycete bacteria. So this is just a swath of different types of actinomycete bacteria grown on an agri-plate. Maybe use these in a biology class at some point. There are over 2,500 unique species of actinomycete bacteria identified currently, and scientists expect that there are many, many, many more to discover. So what this means is that if we have already so many antibiotics from the known actinomycete bacteria, if we can keep discovering new actinomycete bacteria, we're gonna to continue to find new antibiotics. So these bacteria should really be prioritized in terms of antibiotic discovery. Now there's really two methods that we can use in terms of discovering and developing antibiotics from actinomycete bacteria. The first is just to look for brand new molecules from them, and the second is to take an existing antibiotic and modify its structure a little bit in order to combat resistance. So let's look at both of these ways. So in traditional antibiotic discovery, what scientists would do is they'd go out and collect a soil sample, and these actinomycete bacteria are very prevalent in soil samples. So we bring the soil samples back to the lab and plate them out on media that helps the bacteria to grow. And you might see something like this where you have lots of different types of bacteria growing on this plate. So then we can take each type of bacteria and grow it individually. And then we can take these cultures of bacteria and extract them. And what they produce are lots of different types of antibiotic molecules. Now, the process going from the bacteria to the molecule is really where all of the hard work of the scientists go in. Now this process takes many years and a lot of money, but essentially the scientists will take all of the, um, all the molecules out of the bacteria, identify them, test them for biological activity, and then develop them into drugs. And this is still really an effective paradigm for discovering new antibiotics. But what we really need to do is target these new species of actinomycetes. And that's really something that I'm interested in doing um, in terms of research. So we know that these actinomycetes are really efficient at making these antibiotics. And in the past, what we've, all we've done really is gone from the organism straight to the antibiotic. But again, we're seeing these resistant varieties of bacteria where these antibiotics are no longer effective. 
So one way to combat that resistance is to change the structure of the antibiotic just a little bit. And one way to do that is to take, to go into a chemistry lab and build a new antibiotic from scratch. Or you can take the existing antibiotic and modify the structure after it's come out of the bacteria. Now, both of these methods are really difficult because these are very, very complicated structures. So while the chemists, we can do it, but it's very difficult. Again, these actinobacteria are incredibly efficient in building these molecules. So what I'm doing right now as a postdoc is trying to understand exactly how the bacteria make the antibiotics. And now we've already heard about DNA being translated into proteins from Emily here. So essentially what the research is going to now is understanding exactly how a bacteria's DNA is translated into proteins and how these massive protein complexes actually synthesize these antibiotics. So if we can learn exactly how these uh, very efficient organisms build these antibiotics, what we can do is try to manipulate these little factories to make new antibiotics. So picture the actinobacteria as a factory that has an assembly line, right, like a car assembly line. And essentially, that assembly line is gonna build the antibiotic. So what we can do then is take a rational engineering approach to modify the DNA in the bacteria, and this will modify our assembly line proteins that build the antibiotics, and this can make these changes in the structure that will help combat resistance. This approach will really um, complement understanding antibiotic resistance. So if we know exactly how a bacteria, um, how the bacteria resistance works, and we know what part of our antibiotic structure to change, we can then engineer our actinobacteria to make the new antibiotics. So what you can do in terms of combating antibiotic resistance is first protect yourself and your others from infection. Wash your hands often, right? get vaccines for bacterial infections, and try to keep yourself and others safe. It's also important to exercise discretion in the use of antibiotics. So if you have a common cold, don't let your doctor prescribe you antibiotics, because again, this is an inappropriate use of these drugs. And what's really important is supporting scientific research in antibiotic discovery. Most of this research is left to academic scientists like Dr. Palum, Dr. Freund, and myself, and other researchers at places like Stanford. And also, supporting legislation that funds scientific research is also really, really important. Thank you.